VBS, what a great display um, back there, uh, kind of getting us excited. And uh, once again, if there's items or if you're going to volunteer, and I know I heard or overheard people, well, maybe I can do this day or that day. Hey, listen, before, during, after, you know, there's a, a lot of variety. And you guys know this. You guys are kind of the, the, the core, the faithful. But be praying for that, and we'll take some time at the end to pray specifically uh, for that. Um, one other thing here, and then I want to uh, turn it over to Jordan. Uh, if you're interested in Charlie Tiernan's um, uh, nursing home address, you can uh, see me afterwards. Several people came up to me and said, hey, can I get that down? I want to go visit him this week. And that's an encouragement to me. So if you're interested in that, um, you can see me. Um, Jordan and I have been talking about this. <laughs> um, he's ready. I, I love it. I love it. Jordan and I have talked about this, I think, probably since like January or sometime. And so I'm looking forward to it. Um, it is a great opportunity to uh, be in a church where there's other men that desire to share the Lord's word. And uh, it's, uh, I appreciate it because it's other men that, that are uh, kind of carrying the vision along. And also it's good as a church to hear from other men as well. And I know Kelly spoke at Men's Breakfast um, yesterday. And we're going to listen to Jordan uh, tonight. And so we're going to jump into Nehemiah chapter 9. 9 or 9 and 10? Just 9. Uh, I gave him a big chunk. And, and so, so you come here. I think they want you wired up as well. And so... So, so we're in Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, it is a great opportunity to teach, largely because it kind of forces you to do some studying. I don't know why, but for some reason, sometimes when I'm just reading devotionally, I'm, I'm content with, with passing by something and maybe being a little clueless, but when you're presenting it to other people, you kind of feel like you need to, need to have a better whereabouts. So... That's probably a, not a good way of, of approaching your devotional life, but for some reason it's even a stronger in incentive to not just lead yourself astray, but lead many others if you're just clueless. But, so Nehemiah chapter 8. I just want to do a little bit of recapping. We won't go over you know, the whole book of Nehemiah like we've already been through. The book of Nehemiah, obviously a great book of God's God's providence, his sovereignty, and his strength in the life of the Israelites, finally bringing them back to the city of Jerusalem to reestablish the, the, or to rebuild the wall and to protect the temple and to, to regather his people and to um, begin pushing forward in the, the newness of um, the reestablishment. And we got to see God, God power, God's power in. Uh, the people overcoming the opposition of Sanba uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and all the other opposition they faced and the degradation they faced from the people. And we got to see God help them through that and help them complete the wall. And what was it, 32 days or something like that? Just a, um, just a miraculous achievement for the time. Um, but then we got to the, book, the chapter 8 and... Um, we went through that. All the people gathered themselves together, it says in verse 1, as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they studied the word of God. And they spent a lot of time doing so. And um, as we spoke this morning, they had this, they had this desire, this hunger and thirst for righteousness. And, and we can see that as we read this chapter, the way they responded with lifting up of hands, with faces on the ground and... and uh, just their, their emotions, their affections were captivated by the Word of God in such a way that it was, it was going to be effective. It was going to be powerful. As we know, 2 Timothy 3.16, the Word of God is, is profitable for, for doctrine, for correction, for instruction, for rebuke. We, we, know, we know all these things. And we know, as a, was it, I think Hebrews 4.7, it says, The Word of God is quick and, and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword and dividing asunder and... and uh, convicting to our spirits. So we, we know all this. And the people responded in a great way. And remember, they wept. That was, uh, let's see, we got down in, it says in, in, in verse 3, they were attentive unto the book of the law. And uh, later, later on, it says in, in verse 9, it says at the end of verse 9, 
uh, this day, this is what Ezra, the scribes and the leaders are saying, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So the law was convicting to them. It makes me think back to um, uh, Moses and that, that story of, of uh, the people, the Israelite nation, as they're out in the wilderness and they come to Mount Sinai. And I don't know if you remember that grand presentation of the law. It was clear. God wanted to present himself, present the law in such a way that the people stood in terror. He, he presented himself in a terrible way. So the people come before the, the Mount Sinai and there's thunder and lightning and um, this cloud. And God says, wash your clothes, have all the people wash their clothes. Don't come to your wives for three days. And when you come to the mountain, I'm going to speak to the people. And the sound of the trumpet gets louder and louder. And the people were terrified. And I think that ought, that ought to be our response when we hear the word of God uh, and, and we are convicted. I think the response should be one of, of terror to a degree. That, that ought to be our first response, I think, when we hear, hear the word of God. Um, John, or, uh, let's see, John, I think it's chapter 5. Let me find my place, John 16.8. says, uh, uh, let me just turn there. A great passage of... Uh, the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives. John 16, 8 says, And when he has come, this is Jesus, when he left, he promises the Holy Spirit will come. And he says, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Or reprove could be convict. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So it's this Holy Spirit that does this convicting that that um, causes us to maybe tremble in his presence, as the people did. Remember, uh, Moses comes back up, down from Mount Sinai, and the people say, don't let God talk to us again. You can talk to us next time. Don't let God talk to us again. So, And then even, even Moses, when he stood in the presence of the Lord, and he comes back, and his face is glowing. The people say, you've got to put something over your face, because... The glory of the Lord had like imprinted itself on Moses, and and uh, the people were just terrified, even of the reflection of God's glory and the glowing halo of of Moses' face. So this is how the people respond, and the reason I'm leading up to this is I think uh, chapter nine, kind of Nehemiah chapter nine, feeds off chapter eight. We pick up where we left off, where we left off in Nehemiah chapter eight. You remember also Nehemiah chapter eight. Um, the leaders gathered together the second day of the seventh month. The seventh month was a, a holy month for the, for the Jews on the Jewish calendar. This was, the seventh month for them was probably was around September. It may have, may have um, gone into October a little bit, but um, this was their, their seventh month, and they had three feasts during this month. They had uh, or at least three holidays, the Day of Atonement, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and they had the Feast of Trumpets, I believe. They had one other feast. Um, but anyways, they find that, hey, you know, we, Feast of Tabernacles is coming up. Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, uh, Sukkot, I think they, the Hebrews called it. This was when the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, observed God's goodness in bringing them out of Egypt. And they stayed in tents. They dwelt in tents in, in remembrance of how they dwelt in tents in the wilderness and how God provided for them and cared for them. And they're like, hey, this is coming up. It's supposed to be on the 15th of this month. And so the people prepare and they observe the feast just like they're supposed to. And this feast, as prescribed in Leviticus 23, it lasts for seven days. And then the eighth day is supposed to be a solemn assembly where they, where they just consider um, the, themselves, their sin, their depravity, and, and God's goodness. So, if you, go, if you do some calculating, the seventh month, the 15th day, starts this eight day, seven day, but the eighth day is also included as a, a solemn day. So, for 15 plus eight, we get to day 22, but yet, chapter nine, we start, it says, now in the 24th day of this month. So, what, my point is, this wasn't a day prescribed of the Lord. This wasn't 
Um, it wasn't one of the feasts we read about in Leviticus 23. The people, kind of like we just had the revival services and, and the people were captive. I, I hope we were all captivated by the Word of God. These people were captivated by the world, Word of God. And the, the uh, spirit that they were in continued, continued on past day 22. Day 24 says, The children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. These aren't very familiar customs to us, uh, are they? How many times have we thrown dirt on our heads? Like, Ooh, this, we gotta, we gotta show ourselves for how, how lowly we are, how humble, or how poor of spirit we are. So this isn't customary of us, but you can find this custom all the way back in Job. Remember, um, the people see Job and his condition, and and the Bible says they start throwing dirts on, or throwing dirt on their heads. Um, so it was a I think a symbol of, of despair, of lowliness, of um, weeping, grief, just to see Job in that state. And then um, I wrote, there's probably many examples. I wrote another example down, Jonah. In Jonah 3.6, it talks about how Jonah, forced by God, finally made it to Nineveh, uh, proclaims uh, the word of the Lord and um, the people are convicted under the with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gives them that conviction, and the people dress in sackcloth and they sit in ashes. So we see this this sackcloth there too. Sackcloth, um, it's like a linen. It's like a uh, it's like goat's hair. It's a woven fabric of goat's hair. So very uncomfortable. It'd be like us wearing like a cheap wool jacket or something. So we're wearing a cheap wool jacket and we get through dirt on our heads and we're sitting in ashes. Clearly, um, just an extreme, a dr dramatic representation of the sin, the, the conviction that people were feeling. And uh, I think this is, like I said before, I think this is a great place to start. Uh, just recently, I've been trying to evangelize a, a, um, a friend of mine, someone I, I collaborate with, purchasing hay for my goats, and somebody I've, I've known from the past, too, when I used to own cows and stuff. And, and we talk, and, and I, I present the gospel message to him, the, the goodness of, of God the Father in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And, uh, and he confirms with me, oh, I believe in God. And, and he's in agreement with most everything I said. And I, I walk away like, why couldn't I have been more successful? What was the problem there? And as I'm discussing it with Alyssa, I think we come, upon the, come across the problem. He's not aware, he's not convicted of his sin. Like, yeah, maybe, sure, sure. Yeah. Maybe if I said, you know, the Ten Commandments, have you ever broken one of these Ten Commandments? He'd probably say, yeah, yeah, sure, maybe, but there's no conviction. So I think that's a great place to start. The conviction of the Word of God. It's profitable for that. It's profitable for rebuke. And the Holy Spirit is, is that uh, person that does this work of convicting. So we pick up in verse 2. It says, And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God. One fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Do you remember the watches? So we have, at least in the New Testament, we really see Jesus came to them on the water in the fourth, third or fourth watch of the night. I can't remember. So the, the Jews, they broke up their day in eight watches. So four watches in the night, four watches of the day. So... So with uh, these, these uh, so we take a fourth of the day, and we can deduce three hours. So for three hours, three hours they spent, uh, they spent observing the word of God, and then the next three hours, they spent confessing their sins and worshiping the Lord. Not just their sins, but the Bible says the sins of even their, their fathers, even their ancestors. So they look back and 
and they speak truth about who they are, about their problems, their shortcomings, and um, and they spend some time uh, meditating on three hours, in fact, meditating on that. But it says something interesting at the end of verse three. It says, "Confess and worship the Lord their God." There's actually a comma here. It's in, in the King James version. It says, "Confess, comma, and worship the Lord their God." And in other versions, uh, I didn't see a comma. It says, "Confess and worship the Lord their God." Is confessing worship? Can we can we worship God in confessing? That was a question I had as I did this study. So you can you can ponder that question. So let let's do a little case study here. Romans ten nine. We know what this verse says, right? Thou shalt confess, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? Is this worship? 1 John 1 9. We said, it says, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we know these. We're familiar with these verses. Um, Psalm 51. Great chapter of David's confession to the Lord of his sin what he did with Uriah, what he did with Bathsheba. Great chapter. And he, he talks about how uh, God's not pleased with sacrifices. It's a broken heart and a contrite spirit that pleases the Lord. This is what, this is what, uh, this is what God wants. He was sick and tired of these sacrifices. You know, picture something the people were told to do. The people were told to make these sacrifices to God. And f the heart, the motive behind it is so lost God, God's tired of it. He's sick of it. It's, it's disgusting in, it, to him. But he wants a broken and a contrite heart and spirit. And then I think, a, I think that maybe the linchpin of this argument, Joshua 7.19, if you want to turn there with me. Joshua 7.19 provides, I think, a lot of insight in... Um, what exactly confession is? Joshua 7, 19. Joshua 7, 19 says, <clears throat> actually, would someone read Joshua 7, 19 for me? Would someone volunteer to read that? And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. So let me give some of the backstory in case you just need to jog your memory. One of the first battles, in fact, I think it may have been the very first battle, the Battle of Jericho. And the people um, that the people of, of Israel, the Hebrews, faced. And God did something unusual with this first one. He didn't do this with the, with the latter battles, but the first battle, he says... I want you to dedicate some of the some of the spoil to me. He said in, in chapter six, verse seventeen, and the city shall be accursed, even it. This is after he gives all the instructions about walking around the city, blowing the trumpets, uh, so the wall of Jericho will fall down. After he gives that instruction, he says, The city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein, to the Lord only or to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourself from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Uh, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So I, I think most of the people agreed, and they go out to the battle of Jericho, but the treasures were so good that one man named Achan, remember what he did? He took I forget, was it silver? I think it was silver. And he, and he hid it, remember, in the ground under his tent. He dug a little hole in his tent, and he, he hid that silver. And uh, then the people go out to the Battle of Ai. Remember, they had a terrible defeat at the Battle of Ai. And the people walked back from that downhearted, downtrodden, like, what in the world? Your God was supposed to fight on our behalf. What happened? So God gives Joshua some wisdom that you need to go to Achan. You need to figure out the problem with him. So Joshua goes to Achan. And Joshua knows there's something up with him. God's given him this, this wisdom and insight. And that's when we come to this verse 19 where Joshua says, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel 
and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. So this confession brought glory to God, according to Joshua. Glory, I think, to bring God glory, I think we'd all say, is to worship God, right? That's to show his worthiness. That's to show his, his worth when we bring God, God glory. So how does it bring, how, how is it worshipful, confession? Any thoughts on that? How, how can confession be an act of worship? I think you're agreeing with God of what his law is and saying, I've done wrong. I think in that agreement, you're giving glory to him mm. and seeking to align yourself with mm. him and his attributes. Mm. So these people spent three hours doing this. I thought we could talk about it a little while. But any other thoughts? I think you're removing your own pride giving God the glory that he deserves. Mm. Right, right. Thou mm. shalt not despise. Mm. It's sort of the same thing. If you have a clean heart, that means you've confessed before him. Mm. And that's what he wants. Mm. Right, right, right. So it's an act of faith, isn't it? It's an act of faith when... Sorry. I was going to say, you're saying he's true. And what he said mm. about you, um, God doesn't need to be convinced of that. Mm. But we do, mm. and to acknowledge that what He says is true, right? Um, about our condition, about our sin, what He says about it, is just acknowledging that He's right all along, mm. and, and we can trust Him. Exactly. I think that's a, that's pretty much exactly what I what I jotted down. Um, I said it's, it's an act of faith. It's true. He's he's the origin, or he's the origin. He's the author of truth. He is the truth, the way, the truth, the life. We're told in John. Uh, so this faith is accounted as as righteousness, and it's worship. Um, but of course, we have a quite a vast difference between say, Achan's confession that, yes, I took the silver, and then they stone him, and they lay a great uh, pile of stones over, over Achan's dead body. <clears throat> Isn't it? Now, now in the New Testament, 1 John 1, 9, it's, very, it's, it's a different in, in a very large sense. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, well, the, the pain, everything's secured, isn't it? Remember what Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. You know that they found that same statement, uh, to tell us died, as in Greek. They found that same statement on, on, on receipts in, um, in, in some, some of the archaeological endeavors. They, they found that statement. It means paid in full. It's at the bottom of the receipt, or however, in some of these languages, they, they read backwards or something. Wherever it was on the receipt, it was clear. This debt is paid in full. So, so yes, it's secure. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, our sins have been forgiven. We are already cleansed from unrighteousness. But isn't it true that this is going to be, the confession is going to be a characteristic of a believer? And if we're not abiding in him, if we're not persevering as saints, aren't we, shouldn't we question if we're really his? So, uh, the, so this confession, it, what an important part of our Christian life and of our worship. I, don't, I think we often don't think of that. Of course, we often worship, we often think worship music or this or that, but confession, I feel like, is on the bottom of the, the list. I think it should come first. We ought to come before God with these contrite, broken hearts. And I think it, it exposes our frailty to God and our, our just reward. In Aiken's case, uh, it was also a speaking of truth, right? I think he he recognized, yes, I did wrong. Yes, I deserve the consequences for the wrong I did. So I, I think that it, it was it was the same in that respect for Aiken, except I, I'm not sure that his uh, his eternal destiny was secure. And um, 
I think it's also not these things. It's confession. Um, it's very different than this. How about, how about this? When we encounter a trial or a difficult time, we might say, oh, God, the sovereign, sovereign God, why would you put me in this situation where I would experience this obstacle and fall? And um, that wouldn't be a truthful way of looking at it. That wouldn't be an accurate perception of things. Yes, God's sovereign. Is it his fault you sinned? No. Was it his, his plan even that that may have taken place? Yeah, I think, I think God is uh, sovereign in all those things. Is it God's fault? No. So a confession is an accurate view, an accurate perception of, of God and his holiness, his greatness and goodness, and our frailty before him, and what's just to us. The wages of sin is death. And so, therefore... I think confession points to God, the glory of God's grace. Can you see that? When we confess our sin, we acknowledge we're in need of a Savior. And it points to God's great glory and His grace. As I was contemplating that, that, con that concept a little bit, um, I thought about uh, the... the uh, trying to find my place here, but the, the greatness of, of God and, and uh, His grace to us, and um, something Paul said in Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So we've got to avoid that. We've got to avoid that pitfall or that temptation to say, this confession was only brought about from my sin, so because of my sin I confessed, and and the fruit was worship. That would be a very uh, inappropriate view. So this is what I'm saying. It's, this is what it's, the confession is not. It's not blaming God as the sovereign God for our sin. It's also not. Um, it's it's also not uh, uh, saying that ultimately Christ was or God was glorified. It is true, as Paul. Paul uh, made it very clear in Romans. God, God's glory, the glory of his grace, is magnified in, in saving us from our sin. Without sin, how, how was the, the slain lamb of God, the, that eternal song, remember? The, the lamb who was slain, this is an eternal song. It was always a, God's plan for the lamb to be slain. But it kind of required... Uh, us to sin to bring about his saving grace didn't it but it would not be fair or accurate as Paul said to ask a question like or to make a statement we might as well continue in sin that grace may abound yes where there is sin grace does much more abound the Bible makes clear but this is no argument for sinning and, and uh, Paul addresses that okay let's move on verse 5 Actually, let's go through verse 4. It says, did we read 3? And uh, yes, they, for the fourth part, they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Joshua, and this is just an exercise in pronunciation, but I'll do my best. Uh, Jeshua and Bani and Cadmiel and Shabaniah and Buni, Sherebiah, Bani and Chenani, and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shabaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, or from everlasting to everlasting, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. What a great thing that God is so great, so infinite, that he's above our blessing and our praise. And we're going to read it. We're going to read a great prayer um, of blessing and praise to God. But God's above this. He's greater than this. And uh, that's just a great truth to ponder. And this has taken me longer than I thought it would, so we'll do this quickly. But Ephesians, Ephesians 2. I know I'll get some brownie points for turning there. Ephesians 2 says, uh, verse, where is it? Uh, for, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, 
Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come. So I'm going to talk about how he's exalted above. Like we can't reach. We're, we're going to fall short of, of giving him accurate exaltation or full uh, to represent fully his glory. And um, because we always need to learn more, right here it says in verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So we, we, we can't obtain a perfect exaltation of God. It says for ages to come, all through eternity, I believe, we're going to be learning more and more of God's glory and the glory of his grace. You say, 1 Corinthians 13, then we'll, we'll fully know, even as we are known. We can't be, we're, we're still not going to be infinite like God. He's still, he has, he has plenty to teach us, so we're not going to be bored in heaven. We're going to have plenty to do. He's going to show us, the, and I don't think he's showing us by bringing us into the classroom and, now, now, pupils, let me teach you how great my glory and grace is. I think he'll, he'll probably be showing us just like, just like he's done here for us. And when we, when we stumble or fall, not that there'll be any, any sin in heaven, but when we recognize his salvation and who, who, the powerful, mighty, awesome Savior he is, um, because of some event, we, are, we see his glory. We see the glory of his grace. So he, he calls, the Father calls us up to sit at his right hand. What an act of grace to sit right beside, right beside his throne, right next to him. Um, what an act of grace. I, so I think he's going to display this in just further ways of showing how, just lavishly unleashing his riches on us. So he's exalted above all blessing and praise. And now what I want to do is I want to read through the next verses. And this is what this is what I'd like. I want you to catch an attribute of God. He's merciful, steadfast love. Catch an attribute and catch why. So we often we often do this. God's so good. And then he's yeah, God's so good. And then it's like, well, why is he so good? And the things that we like about it, don't we elaborate about it a little bit? So so let's Let's find that attribute, and if, if you can, if you've only found the attribute, that's fine. But if you can find the because, say, God's, God is full of steadfast love because he heard the cry of his people in Egypt, for example. So we're going to read a history of God's sovereign goodness to the people, and you, you find these attributes and the because. Can I have somebody read... Verses um, 6 through 15. Please. Thou, even thou art, oh, did you say five? Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and a host of heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name of Abraham and foundest his heart faithful before thee and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it, I say, to his seed and hast performed thy words for thou art righteous and it see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard us their cry in the Red Sea, and show us signs and wonders upon Pharaoh, and on all his servants, and on all the people of his, of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them, so didst thou get thee a name, as it is this day. And what verse did you say? Uh, 15, please. <laughs> Through 15, please. And thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou lettest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, 
and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they that I should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promises, promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou had sworn to give them. Talk about God-centered, huh? We're, it's not, uh, Abraham was, Abraham was so good, and so, so God uh, spotted him from heaven, and he's like, you're the big cheese. <laughs> As we heard this morning, you're the big, you're the big cheese, and I'm going to do something great with you. You're smart enough. You're capable. Um, and, and then he, uh, he makes an awesome general out of Joshua, and they just go ravaging the, the countries of the promised land. And it, you notice how we read, God did this, God did that, God did this, God did that. So, so you tell me, point out, point out an attribute, and if you would, attribute's fine if that's all you have, but if you've, if you've seen... Uh, the explanation or the because, please point that out too. Words and promises he made to Abraham. But I find that interesting because I don't, I wouldn't have attached the word righteous to that description. I would have maybe said he's faithful or trustworthy. Good. So let's just spend this time like they did, praising our great God for what he did for them, and, and maybe we can make application in our hearts. What he's, he's do, he does for us, yes. To, to use my word, trustworthy, um, because God made a covenant with Abraham and he followed through on it. Mm. He provided what he said he would do. Mm. God is a provider. You see that in verse 12 by leading them day by day, and then also by in verse 15 uh, daily giving them. Um, bread and water so it's not God doesn't show up periodically in their lives like he does the great things but he also is in our day to day as well hmm. God is all powerful and because of the signs and wonders he did under Pharaoh and then also giving them bread from heaven and water out of God Hmm. Okay, let's now let's read if someone could uh volunteer to read verse sixteen through um twenty four, please. Is that too long? Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. But they and our fathers fell proudly and hardened their nets hearken not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed the captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, this is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had brought great provocations. If thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners, so they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Their children also multipliedst thou as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land concerning which thou hadst promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. 
So the children went in and possessed the land. And thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. Hmm. What do we say of God? And what did, how can we explain how an attribute of his? Or maybe what do we see of us? And, uh, you know, we see, we're, we're talking about God's greatness and his goodness, but the backdrop is just rotten, man, right? Constantly just rebelling and faithless and sinful and gross. I guess I see, uh, you know, that we're mindful of that one, or neither we're mindful, it really just means like, they easily forgot about how great their God was. Like, it, I mean, none of us, I mean, we, we look at these attributes, I guess, and I think, you know, we haven't seen God in this way. We don't go out every morning getting manna, and, and so, but yet He has given us salvation. <laughs> but it's just amazing that how forgetful and how bent man is and we are away from God and yet God continually continues to pursue them mm-hmm. and continue, continues to give mercy and continues to show signs um, mm-hmm. that he is God mm-hmm. and so I guess in that maybe you know the attribute is there's just endless mercies and a horrible forgetful mm. people. So, such and such are we. Mm. Mm. Yeah, like the story of Hosea. Hosea buying his his uh, prostituted wife back from the slave market, just like we're purchased from the slave market of sin. Shoes didn't wear, had food, water, yeah, and their clothes too. Mm. Okay, let's read uh, verses. I'll, I'll, t- I'll read the remainder of the chapter. At, we're at verse 25. And they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells, digged vineyards and olive yards and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves or themselves in thy great goodness. Man, do we delight ourselves in God's great goodness. He's been so good to us and we delight ourselves just like they did. Nevertheless, they were dis- disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they were wrought, or, and they wrought great provocations. Therefore, thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies, who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Can you guess what time period we're talking about? When he gave them saviors to save them out of the hand of their enemies, judges. Samson, Gideon. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies, and testifiedst against them, that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly, and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder, and hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiest against them by thy spirit and thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For thou art a gracious and merciful God. 
I think we got to catch that why. I think that why is so supremely important. Why did God not utterly consume them and forsake them? This verse says it right here. Right? This verse says, Thou didst not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. It was his great mercy's sake, right? God's name is most important to God. I get this great book I'm Started reading, started reading on the plane to Uruguay. Haven't made much progress since. Such a great book, though. I want to get back into it. It's called God's Passion for His Glory. God, God's greatest passion is His glory. That's the best reason He has to love us. That's the best reason He has to be merciful to us. His name. Um, moving forward, it says, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep his covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us. This sounds like a confession statement, right? You're just for what you've done to us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments, and thy testimonies wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness thou, that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are our servants to the, uh, this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof, and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. It wasn't, uh, you got to catch their tune, you got to hear, hear what they're saying here. It, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't for any other reason that these kings oppressed them. But God, God's sovereignty, God sovereignly disciplining them, and because of all this, so this is what this chapter heads to, and this is kind of the clincher for the next chapter, which will be good. Um, it says, because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. And I won't talk too much about what that covenant is, but they want to. They want to make a covenant renewal. And how often do we need to do that? We need to start with this confession, this broken, contrite heart. We need to see God for who He is and, and being vastly, infinitely good. A God that we could, our, our exalting and blessing would always fall short of. And uh, then we need to, um, after reassessing things, we need to make some uh, commitments to God. Right? Those spiritual disciplines are so, so important in our lives. You know, maybe it's spending time in His Word, or re renewing our commitment to spending time in His Word, or renewing our commitment to. Uh, for me, it's being patient with my children, or whatever it might be. I think we need to re renew that commitment or covenant. And then it's so good to have it in writing. It just keeps us accountable. Maybe someone else has a copy of it to keep us accountable, or you know, whatever, th whatever that might be. Um, okay, I have no idea what time we're supposed to go to, but let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and your, your greatness. Um, you're so vast, we could, never, we could never come to the end of the glory of your grace. And so help us to marvel in that and help us to start the wonderful, exciting, joyful journey of meditation on this of meditation on your goodness and, and uh, I know this brings us pleasure in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore so help us to help us to meditate on these things uh, on your great glory your sovereignty uh, help us not to um, help us not to be self-centered help us not to to look at things from a perspective of human power and wisdom uh, for indeed you are you are sovereign, and, and we uh, place our faith in you. 
So guide us and lead us and protect us. Thank you for this body. Bring unity to it and, and blessing. Uh, for your name's sake, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.